So this is uh, terrific. I'm very grateful to Kate and her colleagues at, uh, at the state and Rhodey Native, the um, companion program that actually grows a lot of these plants and makes them available uh, through local nurseries. So uh, this is wonderful development. And my argument is, once again, that I think uh, uh, this isn't going to win everybody over from pulling up their lawn and putting in the native uh, trees and shrubs like this. My argument is that it wins over an additional group of people that aren't purely sold on the ecological uh, argument alone. All right, so very quickly, and, and I apologize for how text-heavy a lot of my slides are here, but uh, this show will be available to you later, and you could read these uh, at your convenience. I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through all the text here. The important thing is just to say, uh, once again, as I said before, this is a way to make landscape relevant to people, to spice it up literally as figuratively. If it's got edible species, everybody eats. Eating is potentially relevant to anyone. So you have an argument uh, that can has a very broad appeal to uh, folks and in, in beyond just the bird watchers and, and the butterfly watchers and stuff like that. So at, now when I uh, teach foraging, which I do frequently, and here's a few examples of when I do it, uh, I'm not just talking to people about native species. I'm talking to them about edible weeds, edible invasive species, and everything in the landscape you can nibble on. And actually, the edible weeds and invasives, uh, because they're so plentiful and they have relatively less ecological significance and importance and value than the native species, uh, they offer more relaxed foraging opportunities is that you can, you can pick them without worrying too much about impacts on uh, other wildlife that need them and stuff like that. So I. It, so when I'm interacting in the landscape with people, I'm teaching them those plants too. But when it comes to actually recommending things for planting, I stick to native species because uh, those I, I, I'd, li I'd like to see an enhancement of biodiversity as well as enhancing the foraging opportunities. So that's what this topic is about. Th this slide just covers what we're not covering. You can read that later. Uh, all right, uh, two issues I just want to cover before we get into the plants. Um, uh, I was told by a native plant society to make sure to uh, give you this precaution, which is be very careful, including maybe not even at all, when you have a site that is an intact uh, uh, native plant community. Uh, you want to leave that alone in general and just allow those plants to continue the way they are rather than uh, putting in other things, even if they're native species uh, that could alter the plant community. So uh, most of the sites that I'm dealing with that I'm leading foraging walks on, and I suspect that most of the sites a lot of you are working on, are sites that have a history of human disturbance. They were farmed at one time or forested at one time. And, uh, and there is an opportunity, you know, you're talking about an altered plant community already, and there is an opportunity to bring native plants in uh, that enhance the biodiversity of the site and the edibility of the site. Okay, and then, of course, there's a lot of uh, properties out there, including properties I get invited to leave foraging walks on, where there's no gathering or picking allowed of any kind. For example, Mass Audubon Society has a no collecting policy. Uh, they're not going to take you away in handcuffs if you nibble on a blueberry along the trail, but you're not supposed to go in with baskets and buckets and filling them up. And I think that's perfectly fine, and so I respect and, uh, and honor groups that have a no collecting policy, but uh, there's other places where they realize that uh, you know, connecting people to the landscape through their taste buds is an effective way for them to feel connected to that landscape, and so they'll allow at least some kinds of foraging. All right, so um, you need to know whether a plant is native or not. So here's a good um, reference material from Massachusetts. Uh, a lot of other states have similar things. Uh, then there's a wonderful website, if you haven't been there already, called uh, Go Botany, which is maintained by the New England Wildflower Society. It's got great information, and uh, it does tell you whether or not a plant is native. Then the definitive work on this topic for New England is Arthur Haynes, of luminous volume there are uh, pictured on the right side. Okay, so now let's uh, get into the plants. And uh, these are organized chronologically by foraging opportunity, which makes logical sense to me. I don't know if it does to you, but that's how I did it. So let's uh, go right in. All right, so let's start with this one. And I'm sure everyone recognizes these as fiddleheads, but I should tell you that uh, the fiddleheads 
are probably one of the biggest mistakes that novice foragers make in at least in this region. And uh, I'll tell you why. So uh, usually what happens is they're going out in the woods in the spring and they see a bunch of ferns at the curled up stage like these are here. And they'll say to themselves, oh, fiddleheads, gee, that looks just like what I've seen for sale in the stores. It must be the same thing. And so they pick it and they uh, bring it home, they cook it up and they take a bite and it tastes horrible. And they say, oh, where did we go wrong? Where they went wrong is they harvested the wrong species of fern. Of all the species of ferns I know that grow in the Northeast, I only know of two that taste good and only one that's safe to eat in quantity, and that's this species. This is the ostrich fern, which is readily available in the nursery trade. Uh, these do plant well, provided you've got the decent uh, habitat for it. Uh, they should do fine. And then you can gather the fiddleheads uh, in the spring when they first come up. So the timing for this is uh, usually second, third week of April is when you'll see the ferns at this stage in uh, southern New England. And uh, this is a good time to mention conservation because this is a plant that is harvested not only by uh, foragers picking for themselves, but there's uh, some commercial picking going on. And, uh, and it's important for people to pick sustainably. So when I'm out picking fiddleheads in the wild, I'm picking one or two of the little uh, fiddleheads per clump and I'm letting the rest go. Because if I picked uh, all of them and then a few grew back and a week or two later somebody followed into the woods and they picked all of them, that could sap a lot of strength from the rhizome and you could possibly kill the plant. So uh, the conser conservation ethics is a very important part of all the foraging instruction that I give and I encourage all of you that want to uh, you know, play up the edibility of plants and native species is to uh, bring up conservation too because uh, it's important that these plants continue to thrive in the landscape. So anyway, how do you distinguish the ostrich fern from all those other species of fern? Very quickly, I'll tell you. First, you need the right habitat. Ostrich ferns tend to like alluvial floodplain soil. They can be planted and grow other places, but when you encounter them in the wild, this is pretty typical habitat. This is along the Connecticut River in Deerfield, Mass. And then uh, the mature fronds have this very distinctive vase-shaped clump, and then you see the fertile fr fronds, the spore-bearing fronds, on the left side there where the white arrows are, and, uh, uh, and look for those. And then uh, on the fiddleheads itself, you'll see that there's a little U-shaped gouge running down the center of each stem, and then uh, papery little scales, uh, brown scales that flake off the fiddlehead, the crochers, the curved up parts. So it's not like a wool, like a cinnamon fern. So those are the distinguishing characteristics of the ostrich fern. So if you've ever bought ostrich ferns at a store and cooked them up and eaten them and been not very impressive with those fiddleheads, uh, here's something I suggest you try. So here's a foraging walk I went on uh, that somebody else led last year along the Connecticut River. And we went, uh, this is Beth Basler, and she brought a cooking stove to the fiddlehead patch. And we ate the cooked fiddleheads 10 minutes after we picked them. And they were amazingly good that way. So uh, I recommend giving that a try. And of course, if you've planted these in your own yard or your clients have them in their own yard, they can certainly do that very quickly, cooking them after they pick them. All right, so here's a native species called the wild leek. It's been in New England and Northeast for a long period of time. And that's how it was known until relatively recently in the Northeast it began to be called by its southern Appalachian name, which are ramps. And this is a bit of a cautionary tale in terms of wild plants that people are eating because this one I have seen a lot of unsustainable gathering going on in the woods where they'll take a patch of ramps like this and they'll dig it all up, every single plant. They'll completely wipe it out. And this is not for people picking to bring home and have you know, a meal for themselves or a couple dinner guests or their family, whatever. These are people converting the plants to cash that are selling them to chefs and to produce markets. And there's a lot of hyperventilating going on amongst the foodie world and the chef world about ramps right now. And so I've seen a lot of unsustainable behavior going on, and it really is totally unnecessary. And I'm going to tell you why. So here's a close-up of a few of the wild leek plants, and you'll see that each plant has two or sometimes three leaves that connect to the bulb. And the way these plants are often harvested is the entire plants are dug up and removed, physically removed from the place. And once you dig them up, they don't come back. 
but you don't need to dig up a ramp to eat it. You can just pick a leaf off each plant, leave the remaining leaf or leaves attached to the bulb, and leave that bulb on the ground. That is a totally sustainable way of interacting with these plants. And that's what I'm encouraging all the chefs and the people that pick for the chefs and, and, and stuff to just consider the leaves-only harvesting method. Because this is the kind of thing I've seen. This is a famous restaurant down in Westchester County, New York, where they're not even using the ramp bulbs in their, in their very fancy dishes in the restaurant. They're just pickling them. Uh, and even the food co-ops were selling ramps, complete ramps with the bulbs dug up. So I've gotten on the cases of these places, and I'm, I, I am happy to say that I have seen a shift in, uh, in consciousness about this, and I've seen a much greater awareness about how to interact with ramps sustainably. Now, ramps can be propagated, so here's a close-up of a stock bed at the New England Wildflower Society's headquarters in Framingham, Mass., where they grow these out vegetatively, and they're able to pull a certain number of plants out of the stock bed every year and sell those plants, and then uh, they regenerate themselves just vegetatively, and then uh, you know they'll be able to do it again year after year. So, so People are buying these and planting them in their yards, and that's great, and I encourage it. In fact, uh, the more that people have ramps in their own properties, the less that they'll have to hammer the wild population, so that's good. And, and, so, and I bet that the people that plant ramps on their property aren't digging them up, because that would be like killing the goose that laid the golden egg. You just wouldn't be able to enjoy the plants if they're gone, so no, you would harvest them sustainably. You pick a leaf per plant, as I suggested before, and then you'd always be able to enjoy them. All right, so enough about that. Okay, milkweed is a plant that I have uh, seen on restaurant menus, so I'm concerned about that too. But it's a wonderful plant for planting uh, because of its ecological value, because it supports the monarch butterflies, and many other insects love milkweed. Uh, milkweed's got um, uh, at least four different parts that are edible, and they happen chronologically in succession. So that's why I call it a procrastinating forager's dream food, because it's four different stages to eat the plants. If you mess up and miss a stage, you just wait a while until the next edible stage shows up. So there's a chapter on milkweed in my foraging book, which I'll talk about at the end with a lot more details about how to use this plant. So the flower buds are one edible part. and uh, uh, by the way, all the milkweed parts that I talk about eating, I recommend you boil for seven minutes. And uh, the milkweed parts will not shrink or get all mushy on you even after all that boiling. So the milkweed pods are edible too. Same thing, boil for seven minutes and they won't get shrink or mushy on you. Okay, so there is the monarch caterpillar on the flowers over on the left side to remind us that this is indeed one of the uh, plants the monarchs lay their eggs on and the caterpillars eat the leaves and so on. And so uh, as, as we probably have all heard, there's been a very serious decline of monarch butterflies. And so I certainly wouldn't want to do anything that would threaten the, uh, the uh, plants uh, in a place where monarchs need them, which includes this region. So I'm very respectful and circumspect about harvesting this plant. Uh, and um, and you probably want to do so too. So you would want to uh, limit your uh, harvesting to the young pods. They don't really play an important role in the butterfly's life cycle. But what I do as a karmic payback to the milkweeds is that in the fall when the mature pods burst open and the little parachutes with the seeds attached are showing there, I just uh, 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 grab some, put them in my pockets, and as I'm traveling around and if I see an old farm field Without any milkweed, I just release the parachutes and help establish a new colony. All right, sassafras, uh, and uh, this is probably a plant you all know, but in case you don't, it's very easy to recognize because it has leaves with three different shapes, no thumbs, one thumb, and two thumbs, all in the same plant, very easy to spot. So there's two major parts that are edible on the sassafras. There is the root bark, which has a very strong recognizable root beer uh, uh, flavor and aroma. Now the Food and Drug Administration thinks that saffron, one of the essential oils in the sassafras root bark is carcinogenic and they base this on a study where they fed synthetic saffron to rats and some of those rats got cancer. So uh, that's what the study proved. It didn't actually show that there was uh, uh, a human case of cancer caused by sassafras but if you'd like to hedge your bets and not consume the root, I totally support you in that. Uh, I will tell you, though, that it makes a very delicious tea, and it makes an excellent candy. Uh, that recipe is in my book, and it's like the root beer barrels you used to buy at the penny candy store, only uh, even better because there's little bits of root bark embedded in the candy. 
All right, so that's one edible part of this sassafras. And then the young leaves are what are used to make filet powder. So if you've ever heard of filet powder, filet powder is dried powdered sassafras leaves. And the best leaves for that purpose are the leaves that are one inch long and just dry them and grind them up and then add the powder to uh, flavor soups and stews at the end. So um, now besides uh, this plant being uh, yummy, it's also a very pretty plant. I consider sassafras to be one of the underappreciated fall foliage plants. So if you're not sold on just the edibility alone and the fun fact that it's fun to scratch and sniff the plant because uh, 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 all parts of the plant have a fun fruity aroma, uh, then you get this visual uh, benefit as well. Cattails have a whole chapter in my books. I won't spend a lot of time on them, but cattails have an editable immature bloom spike. That's what they look like. You boil them up and eat them. Uh, there's also the cattail heart, the tender heart in the developing stalk of the plant, which is like a cucumber or hearts of palm. Then there's the cattail pollen, which uh, is hypoallergenic that you can collect with a plastic bag in the cattail marsh and just put it through a sieve to take out any impurities and then add it to flour to make these very nutritious and very pretty cattail uh, muffins and crepes and cookies and stuff like that. All right, this is a plant you may not know by sight, but I bet that almost everybody in this call has eaten this plant. This is, in fact, wild rice. And... Uh, Wild rice uh, does grow in New England, and I do know people that have gathered it and, uh, uh, and parched it and winnowed it to go to all that trouble to eat it, and so that definitely is possible. I haven't done it myself, but I know people who have. And uh, for the right kind of habitat, that would be an excellent choice for planting. All right, now sometimes, as you may know, when you mention, when you encourage people to plant native species, they, the response you get from them is, Oh, natives, you're talking about sedges and rushes and really boring green plants. I don't want that. I want something pretty. And so here are two choices of plants that are pretty. They both happen to be edible as well. So on the left side, you've got the meadow beauty, the rexia, and the whole plant has a tart flavor. And then on the right side, you have the rose mallow and uh, all the relatives of rose mallow, which includes hibiscus, which you've heard of hibiscus tea, so you can make a tea from these flowers. And uh, also the marshmallow. Marshmallows are actually originally made from a plant called the marshmallow. And, uh, and I believe you can use rose mallow for that purpose too. Uh, so these are both edible. Now let me just uh, make sure you know, looking at this photo, that these flowers are not actually the same size. The uh, meadow beauty is only about an inch across, and the rose mallow is about five inches across. It's one of our showiest wildflowers. Uh, so, and they both like a similar habitat, though. Uh, meadow beauty I see right along the shore of a pond, and uh, the rose mallow I will see along the shore of a pond or a swamp or a river. Uh, but they, they're both uh, that kind of a plant. Okay, so uh, the genus Tilia, we have the Tilia americana, the American basswood. Uh, the Tilia cordata, which is a non-native introduced species, is edible the same way. The young leaves are edible, and these flowers you can make a tea from, and the tea is very tasty. And it also has two medicinal values, soothing to your digestive system and to your mental state at the same time. So uh, the Tilia tea is very highly regarded in Europe for that reason. Uh, Juneberry, the genus Amelanchier, shadbush, serviceberry. Um, it's one of our earliest bloomers, so landscapers like to choose it for that purpose. Uh, it's a native species, unlike the Bradford pear, which is also chosen for the same reason. This would be a better choice if you're looking for a native early blooming species. So that's what it looks like when it blooms, and that's what it looks like when the fruit is ripe. It's called Juneberry because the fruit is ripe, at least in southern New England and further south, in June. If you uh, have this plant in northern New England, it probably would be better to be called July berry. But anyway, so uh, this is a great plant for stuffing your face right by the tree. The fruit is like a cross between cherries and almonds because uh, they're actually related to cherries and almonds. They're all related plants in the rose family. So Juneberries are great raw. They're great uh, dried. Uh, you can also freeze them and use them later. Uh, now, um, Juneberries come in various sizes. There's uh, dwarf uh, bushes. There's tall trees, 30 feet, 4 feet feet tall. Uh, but the typical Juneberry I see used in landscaping is a tree that's about 12 feet tall. And, uh, and they often bear heavily. Uh, for uh, a couple week period. And then uh, I, I almost always encounter songbirds eating the fruit on the plant, but um, there's plenty of fruit for everyone because they can be eating from the upper branches, I'm picking from the lower branches, and we can all just pick out and have a great time. 
Okay, and this is one of the fun things I like to do with the June berries is make strudel. All right, uh, here's the flowering raspberry, which is uh, our showiest raspberry. It's got these great, enormous maple-shaped leaves and these very pretty uh, magenta-colored flowers. By the way, this plant does not have thorns, which is another attribute to it. Uh, so that's what it looks like when it's blooming. That's what the fruit looks like. It is not the tastiest member of the rubus genus, but those fruits are edible. And um, they're a bit dry, but you can certainly eat them right off the plant, or you could make things with them like uh, uh, jam. All right, here's the black raspberry. And uh, this is a fun one to mention on a day like today, because you could actually spot black raspberries today if you were out walking your dog or cross-country skiing, even all that snow from the photo on the right. The photo on the right shows you the canes with the purpley dust on it. So that's what I look for. And you can see that color very far away. You can be 100 yards away on the opposite side of a field and still spot that color and remember that black raspberry patch and then go uh, remember that spot and then go back in early July to pick the fruit. All right, here's black huckleberries. And I'm sure a lot of people when they go out to pick blueberries, they're picking these instead, which there's absolutely no harm. This is a, a related species. This is a, a waterier and seedier fruit than a blueberry, but otherwise it's perfectly fine. Tends to like a bit of a drier habitat than a regular low bush blueberry, but um, um, could be an excellent landscape choice. Here's the blue huckleberry, which uh, not as many people know about. It's also called a dangleberry. And uh, this one I tend to see in a little wetter habitat. This plant gets to be usually about two and a half, three feet tall. And the fun thing about this one is the fruit is, remains on the plant into early September. And so it's still available after all the blueberry or other blueberry-like fruit is gone. So um, that could be an excellent land, landscape choice. All right, so here is the common elderberry the, um, that's got a, a black fruit. We'll talk about that in a second. Anyway. So I need to get on my soapbox again about the commercialization of wild plants uh, that I've been teaching foraging for over 40 years, and it's only been about the last six years I've seen uh, a lot of interest among chefs and, and foodies and produce markets and stuff about some native species, and this is one of them, and I think it's largely driven from the fact that there is a related species uh, in Europe uh, that is used a lot. Uh, and so people have caught on here, and they're trying to use the species here. So, uh, so this is what I'm concerned about. I got an email from a, a fancy produce store in Cambridge a few years back, and they, the email basically said, tell us where the elderberry plants are so we can pick the flowers and make this syrup that we can sell at our store. I wouldn't tell them. I told them the kind of habitat the plants like to grow in, but I didn't want to talk about a specific spot because I was too afraid they'd just go hammer it. Um, this is this is a scenario that uh, I'm not sure it's actually happened, but I think it's plausible that some chef that's really excited about elderflower says to some underling in the restaurant, go pick me 10 pounds of elderflower. This poor schnook runs out, goes looking here and there for the elderberry, finally finds an elderberry plant in bloom, and looks at that plant and says, you know, if I pick every flower off this plant, I can fill this order. And I don't have time to run around and look for other plants. I've got to get back to the restaurant. So there go all the flowers, which means there's no flowers left for any pollinators. There's no fruit that's going to form in that plant because you have to leave the flowers on the plant to form the fruit. So that's the impact I see when this stuff gets commercialized. It's the monetization, the commodification of wild plants has me concerned. So I still uh, feel like there is an opportunity for people to gather native species and to do it in a conservation-minded way at the small scale of them picking for themselves and a couple friends and stuff like that. It's just when you convert the plants to cash, that's when I see uh, some unsustainable behavior going on. So uh, here's a couple products that are made from the elder flowers. So the drink on the left is made from New Zealand where the elderberries aren't native. So I can't really uh, quibble with that. And on the right side, the St. Germain liqueur supposedly has the elder flower in the recipe. And I would assume that those flowers are being gathered sustainably because otherwise they put themselves out of business. But um, uh, the word that I've been getting out to the folks that seem fixated, I really want elderflower, is to get a local farmer to grow it for them. Uh, as you know, a lot of farms have wetlands on the edge of the farm that you can't plant uh, conventional crops in. So put a row of the elderberry plants in there. And then if you really need to have the flowers, pick those. So you're not hammering the wild populations. So as I mentioned, uh, um, you know, native species, as we know, they have important ecological value. And I'd just like to underscore that 
with the elderberry plant. Some of you may know about this critter. This is an elderberry borer beetle. And the only place this critter lives is inside the stems of the elderberry plants. It doesn't harm the plant. They've co-evolved for eons, so that's not a problem. The problem is that if the foodies and the chefs got so excited about elderflower that they started picking all the flowers off all the bushes we had, that wouldn't kill the beetle directly, but it might uh, make the plants less common in the landscape. And if that happens, then it could hurt the beetle too. So that's why I'm encouraging people to not harm the wild populations. Of course, if the elderberry stays on the plant, this is what's going to remain. It's the elder fruits, which aren't good to eat raw, but you can um, uh, dry them first or cook them first, and then they're edible. Uh, very quickly, here's mayapple, which has an edible fruit when it's fully ripe. This is an excellent landscape choice for a rich woods type habitat, nice uh, uh, deep fertile soil. Uh, these plants have no problem growing in the shade, and uh, they're very interesting plants um, to look at, and the fruit is very tropical flavor. Uh, passion fruit normally doesn't grow north of uh, the Mason-Dixon line, but you can grow it in New England, and I found a microclimate in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I threw some seeds down that I collected in Cincinnati, Ohio, and the seeds germinated, and the vines grew, and they blossomed in fruit form. So in the right spot, you could get this to grow. It's a native species from further south, but uh, I, don't, I don't see any problem trying to get it to grow here. And then same thing with the persimmon. It isn't really native to uh, Massachusetts, but you can get it to grow here. And as you may know, the fruit needs to be fully ripe before you eat it. Otherwise, you'll get all puckery. So uh, you wouldn't want that to happen. All right, here's our brief pause to answer any questions you may have. Hi, Russ. We have just a couple of questions that have come in so far. One is you mentioned how much of certain plants you would recommend taking. Is there a rule of thumb for how much of the native plant to eat without impacting the plant health? Well, what I encourage people to do uh, to be very conservation-minded is first check to make sure there's a lot of whatever you want to gather before you start picking and a lot left over after you're done. I realize that that is not scientific at all, but uh, let me just say for those of you that are concerned about this, um, I consider fruit picking and nut gathering to be more on the benign side of foraging because all you're doing is gathering the seed or the spore dispersal portion of the organism. And if there's a lot on the plant and you pick some and you're leaving some behind, I wouldn't worry too much about that. But if you are stripping all the leaves or flowers off a plant, or if you're digging up a plant to harvest it, that's going to be a lot more traumatic about the plant. And in, in that case, I get a lot more concerned about impacts. OK. We have one other question that's come in about the ostrich fern. Yes. Is there a question, is there a concern about toxicity with this fern that we we don't need to be concerned about? Okay, there's one thing to be concerned about with ostrich fern, and that is you can't eat them raw or undercooked because they have an enzyme in them called thiaminase, which actually breaks down thiamine, vitamin B1, in your body. So uh, you wouldn't want to do that. So I always cook them thoroughly. I uh, pick the fiddleheads and drop them into boiling water, and I boil them for about three minutes. And then you can eat them on the spot or incorporate them into different dishes, but that completely resolves the thiaminase issue. And there is a, 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 a potential carcinogen associated with another fern, the bracken fern, but as far as I know, that's not present with the ostrich fern. Okay. The next question is, one of our listeners' sons has asked, what is the tastiest native plant? Oh, we're going to get to that in the show. What I consider to be the tastiest. My favorite okay. edible wild plant is in this show, so uh, okay. you will find out. Stay tuned. Uh, next question is, we actually have a couple of questions about the May apple. One yes. is, what are some edible plants? Well, the first question is, how do you cook the May apple? Okay, so if they're fully ripe, and uh, you'll know right away if you bite into one, it'll be nice and sweet and tropical, kind of like a guava. If you're not getting a good flavor, it's possible that it's underripe. And... Um, they're not edible when they're underripe. You need to wait till they're fully ripe and soft, and then they're perfectly edible and perfectly safe. And um, any way you can imagine using a tropically flavored fruit works for May apples. So you can make May apple sorbet, May apple chiffon pie, May apple cheesecake, stuff like that. Okay. 
Other than the May apple, what are some edible native plants that would thrive in a shady landscape? Okay, I promise to answer that question later because I've got a couple coming up. But but the ostrich fern would definitely qualify of the plants we've talked about already. Partridge berry would qualify, and uh, wintergreen, Galthria procumbens would qualify, and uh, and there's more coming up in the show. Okay, and we've had a couple of questions about um, how to get milkweed plants started. Oh. <laughs> uh, I find they just come up in my yard because of the fact I'm bringing them home and they just sort of the seeds get uh, established uh, just in the mulch around uh, my blueberry plants and other things and uh, I almost can't stop them which is fine. Uh, uh, that's a question I'm not really qualified to comment because I'm not a propagator but uh, that is knowledge I'm sure is available uh, and, uh, and can be tracked down and uh, and maybe I can find the answer from my propagator friends and get back to this person, but I don't know for sure how to do it, but I don't think it's hard. Okay. Uh, the next is, is there, are there more, is there, <laughs> sorry, sorry, this one is somewhat complicated. Would you speak as a Native American, when you're teaching, do you include that sort of information in your foraging and picking? Oh, sure. Uh, when I'm aware of it, uh, and in many, many cases, the plants that, that are native, that uh, we know today uh, are edible, the Native Americans certainly knew about, and in many cases we learned that information from Native Americans, and I'm very grateful for the knowledge that they shared with people like me that we can benefit from it, because uh, a lot of the plants that they ate uh, are still in our landscape today and still available for us to enjoy, like, uh, for example, let's take the Juneberry. Uh, Native Americans, that was one of their favorite uh, fruits to use in something they called pemmican, which is like the Native American equivalent of power bars where they pound together the dried fruit and nuts and uh, some animal fats to hold it all together and they'd have these very high energy, highly portable bars that they would take with them on journeys so they wouldn't have to be hunting and gathering all the time. Okay, and we're going to take just one quick last question before we move on. Uh, are you familiar with a source for milkweed seed? Oh, you mean other than just visiting the plants in the fall uh, with the pods split open, uh, which are quite numerous, at least in this area. Uh, uh, but but um, probably the best place to go is there's several really good websites on monarch butterflies. And I'm sure that they're encouraging people to plant milkweeds uh, in every opportunity as possible. And I'm sure that they, if you click on the links on those websites, they would have sources for the milkweed seeds and, and probably even advice on how to propagate the plants. Okay, excellent. Well, let's move on and we'll get to the rest of these questions at the end of your presentation. Okay, sounds great. Here we go. All right, sweet fern, speaking about uh, historical use, so uh, this is a plant I'm sure the Native Americans utilized and the colonists used, utilized it. It was one of the plants they turned to to make tea from during the Revolutionary War era when they were boycotting the British tea. And you just steep the leaves in hot water for a few minutes and it has a very interesting flavor. Uh, sweet goldenrod, it's uh, of the many species of goldenrod out there, this is the only one I know of that tastes good and the entire plant has a licorice flavor. So if you're going to plant goldenrod, why not plant the sweet goldenrod because then it has all the values the goldenrod has plus uh, you can make tea from it as well. Then there's spice bush. This is another plant the colonists made tea from. They just steeped the twigs in hot water for a few minutes. and. Um, this plant uh, is a good shade plant. In fact, that's almost invariably how you find it, in the shade, under hardwood forest, often where there's flowing water nearby. And it's a pretty common plant here in the east. Um, and I believe deer do not like it, so that might be an, an extra reason why you want to plant it or recommend that other people plant it. As I note at the bottom, uh, spicebush comes in male and female, and so if you want to plant with berries, you want to plant at least one female to, to help ensure that that happens. So um, the red berries in the photo here, I will dry those and then pulverize them and use them as a black pepper or a Szechuan pepper uh, spice substitute. Uh, they're quite nice, but 
as I also indicated in this slide, those berries are important food for migrating songbirds as they're uh, uh, flying south. Uh, they fuel up in these lipid-rich berries. So it's important to leave plenty of berries on the plants so they get their share too. And here's another reason you might want to plant a spice bush. It's the host for the spice bush swallowtail caterpillar, which is a really cool critter. And by the way, the, these also occur on sassafras. Black cherry is edible. Uh, and uh, note the, the chewed on leaf in the lower left hand corner there. So in Doug Tallamy's uh, uh, tally of plants that host a lot of insect species, black cherry is one of the higher scoring plants. So it supports a lot of insects, which in turn the birds feed their young. Uh, so that it's very good from that perspective. And it's also edible. Uh, and um, the cherries aren't particularly large. They approach but not quite get to a half an inch in diameter, but they can be very tasty, just about as good as a domesticated cherry in flavor. All right, so I've given you a little bit of a hint with a boardwalk here uh, as to what these plants are. Uh, those of you from the coastal area will probably recognize what they are. And for the rest of you, I will just tell you these are beach plums. And in case you don't already know, the best time to spot a beach plum plant in the wild is when it's blooming which is usually in May, uh, latter half of May up here in New England. And um, uh, because when the fruit is ripe, it looks like that. And purple is a hard color to see at a distance. Uh, and you almost, and the fruit grows underneath the leaves. You practically have to be standing right next to beach plum bush to see the fruit on there. But beach plums are great. They don't have to grow in the dunes or by the coast. They will grow anywhere they're planted. Uh, you could amend your soil with a little bit of sandy soil. That would help. Uh, but I don't think they're particularly fussy. Uh, and I have, just by using my observational skills, I've spotted beach plums growing naturally many miles from the ocean and uh, enjoy the fruit that I've encountered. But this is a plant, at least in coastal areas, it's readily available in the nursery trade. You don't have to go to a strictly native plants nursery. Just regular commercial nurseries will carry beach plums. and. Uh, and I think it's a great landscape choice. All right, here's the wintergreen I mentioned. I mean, here's a, a patch in the sun, but this is a plant that tolerates shade very well. The entire plant has the oil of wintergreen in it, so you can make a tea from this plant. Uh, I recommend the tender reddish green leaves that come out in the spring. But actually, there's another plant, and, and the berries are edible too. They're not very sweet, but they do have that wintergreen flavor. But if I'm going to make wintergreen tea, I tend to make it from the twigs of the black or yellow birch tree, because these are more numerous, and there's less impacts of gathering the twigs to make tea. So, um, so what you do is you just take the black or yellow birch twigs, and you peel them, and take the peeled twigs and the peelings, and put them in some uh, jars, uh, and fill it up with water. And basically, that's all you have to do. If you put enough uh, twigs and peel twigs and the peelings in there, just let it sit around for a few hours, you get a nice, strong uh, wintergreen flavor tea that way. And you can tap birch trees for sap, like a maple tree. They start flowing after the maples stop flowing. So around here, that's like the end of March, beginning of April. And the sap flows really copiously. When I tapped some trees many years ago, I was getting a gallon of sap in an hour. So they really gush. But unfortunately, birch trees, the sap is even waterier than maple sap. So you have to boil the heck out of it to get anything. And what you eventually get doesn't have the oil of wintergreen flavor at all. It looks and tastes just like molasses, which is great. But molasses is so cheap and easy to get at the stores, I just advise people to go buy molasses. You're not going to save any time or money making your own molasses from birch sap. All right, I'm happy to tell you there are no poisonous species of viburnums. Not all of them are edible, like maple leaf viburnum doesn't taste good, but we do have several tasty edible viburnum species, including wild raisin. Uh, so the purpley fruit is the right fruit there on the right half of the photo. And nanny berry viburnum lentego has a nice fruit, ripe in uh, late August into September. And probably the tastiest one in this group of viburnums is the hobble bush or moosewood. Uh, and this is a plant that also tolerates the shade really well. And, uh, and the, ber the berries you see in my hand there are the ripe berries. And they're, um, uh, the texture is sort of like prunes. And the flavor almost has a little bit of a clovey spice going on with it. So they're really fun to nibble on as you're hiking in the woods. And this is also a plant with very good fall colors. So another reason you might want to plant it and encourage your clients to plant it. 
Uh, grapes are, are fun to encounter in the wild. Uh, perhaps this has happened to you second week of September. You're walking or riding your bike, and all of a sudden you pick up this grape smell, and you follow your nose to the vine and find the ripe grapes by the vine, and then just stuff your face, which is a lot of fun. So that's the Vitus labrusca. The fox grape is uh, the largest grape species we have around here and probably the tastiest. Uh, this one, uh, you, <laughs> you don't need any propagating skill whatsoever. You basically plant the seeds and they germinate and they come up. And I know this from bitter experience because I used to put these seeds in my compost pile and then I found out I was creating grape seedlings in my raised beds where I was using my finished compost and they just weren't being broken down in the composting process. So you might not want to compost these seeds, uh, but you should have no trouble getting getting them to germinate from the seeds that you want to grow out from this plant. <laughs> so this is the fox grape, and it's also, and that's a pretty typical scene to have a basket like that in my car in the second week of September. So and this is one of the fun things you can make from the, uh, the fox grape, the Vitus labrusca. All right, then there's another species, is the Vitus riparia, or the riverside grape. Uh, I also encounter this in the wild quite a lot. And this one, the, the grapes aren't as tasty as the fox grapes, but the leaves are very tender and green and not woolly in the underside. And so some people that make the stuffed grape leaf recipes prefer this species over the other ones. So there's an example of the stuffed grape leaves from the Riverside grape. All right, sumac, you probably all know this, but I tell people uh, at my talks that they should not be quaking their boots whenever they see a red berried sumac because it's not poison sumac. Poison sumac is drooping clusters of greenish white berries. And so if you're seeing red berries, it's not only not poison sumac, it's an edible sumac. So here's staghorn sumac, which is edible, but also uh, smooth sumac, dwarf sumac, fragrant sumac, winged sumac, uh, all those sumacs with red berries is edible. And it's basically the way that you use it is the same. So what you do is you pick the ripe berry clusters off the plant and like that, and then uh, you just immerse them in a bucket of water for a few minutes, and you, you knead them like it was uh, bread dough. And you're getting the flavor off the berries into the water, and the water turns pink or pinkish-orange color. And then put it through uh, a strainer and a filter, just like a, a cheesecloth or a uh, paper towel just to take out any uh, remaining impurities there. And then you can uh, sweeten it to taste and serve it chilled or hot, however you want it. And there's your sumac aid, and it's very lovely. And it only takes about 15 minutes to go from picking the fruit off the plant to drinking the drink. Now, uh, this also may go without saying, but sumac is one of our more spectacular fall foliage plants, too, so another good reason to plant the plant. All right, here's the slide that those of us from coastal areas might know just from looking at the flowers. Those of you who aren't from the coast might not recognize this plant, but this is, in fact, our bog cranberry, which used to be called craneberry because the flowers resemble cranes, the birds. Anyway, this is what it looks like when it's blooming, and that, of course, is what it looks like when the fruit is ripe on the plant. And although people associate cranberry bogs with the coast in very low elevations, they don't have to grow that way. Any place where they get a little bit of a seep and a nice acid habitat, like uh, where this hair cat moss is also happy, uh, then you might uh, find a favorable environment for the cranberries. Here's the mountain cranberry, which is a relative, and this one doesn't seem to need to grow in bogs. I've seen it uh, on top of mountains in northern New England. Uh, it will grow at a lower elevation the further north you go, so I've seen it in sand dunes up in uh, Nova Scotia. Uh, this is, by the way, uh, virtually identical to the lingonberry, the Scandinavian fruit. Uh, uh, it's a circumboreal species, so we basically have the same thing here. And, uh, and the flavor is very similar to a bog cranberry. Then there's the high bush cranberry, which actually is not a related plant, but it has a very similar flavor. This is actually another species of viburnum. And uh, one nice thing about this fruit is that it remains on the plant usually into the winter. So here's uh, the uh, viburnum edule, the squash berry, uh, which is a very tasty plant, grows in northern New England. It's very sour, so you have to add sugar, but just like you would a regular bog cranberry, it makes an excellent sauce. It's very, very similar to the regular cranberry sauce. Okay, we've got a lot of wonderful edible nuts that are ripe in September and onwards. So here's the first one you're going to encounter. This is the hazelnut. We have two different kinds of hazelnuts, the common hazelnut and the beaked hazelnut. So this is the common hazelnut. Here's the beet hazelnut with that strange husk that looks like a bird's beak sticking out of it. The nuts inside the husk are pretty much the same. 
and I gather these, picking them off the plants before they hit the ground, because if you wait until they hit the ground, you'll never find them. The squirrels and chipmunks will get them all before you do. Then here are uh, acorns, and all oak trees produce acorns, and all acorns are edible, but it's the acorns from what are called the soft oak species that tend to have lower levels of tannic acid, and they require less processing than the hard oak. So the, hof, the soft oaks are the rounded lobe leaves on the left side of the photo, so that's a white oak. Uh, and then the hard oaks, like the red oak, the black oak, and so on. Uh, so those acorns are edible, too. They just require more processing. All right, the shagbark hickory. So this is what I consider to be among the tastiest of all the edible wild plants. And this one I love to gather myself and feed to a lot of people. I did a foraging program in Lexington this morning to a garden club, and I made some cookies for them at the end. And they, uh, they really enjoyed the, the cookies. And also I served the, the, this nut is just terrific, straight out of the shell and put in the toaster oven for a couple minutes. So. Uh, so a basket like that is very uh, uh, typically seen in my car as I'm out gathering the hickory nuts from mid-September to mid-October. And you see that the husk that covers up the nut is a four-parted husk. It often bursts open just with the impact of the nut hitting the ground. And then uh, there's the nut meets in the center of the photo to the left with the penny for scale. And uh, hickory nuts taste like walnuts that have been lightly sprayed with maple syrup, if you've never had them. That's the best way to describe them. And they're good just plain or used in a lot of different recipes. So here is the maple hickory nut pie recipe. This one's in my book. And this is the New England counterpart of the pecan pie. And uh, just about everybody I've ever served this to prefer it over uh, pecan pie. It's really good. All right, and black walnuts, although they're not native to Massachusetts, they grow readily here. They are native to Connecticut, so they're certainly naturalized here. I would consider this a native species, certainly for our bioregion. You don't have to pick these nuts off the tree. Wait till they fall on the ground, and then um, that's what they look like. And you see they have this green husk surrounding the nut, and that is admittedly a bit of a messy task to take that off. And if you do it with bare hands, they may stain your fingers brown. But if you wear gloves, you can avoid that. So once you get the green part off, then that's what the nuts look like inside. If you crack those open, the nut meats, they have very distinctive flavor. It's different from your store-bought walnut. Uh, and I think the black walnuts pair really well with honey. So here's two ways I use the black walnuts, the baklava recipe. That recipe's on my web page. And then the black walnut honey square is another uh, great way to use them. So here's a plant called groundnut. Uh, speaking of Native American usage, this plant was extremely important to the Native Americans, especially along the coastline. Uh, and this is the plant that actually the pilgrims, it helped them to survive over the first harsh winter in the New World. They found a cache of these tubers pictured on the frisbee there on the right. I believe it was none other than Miles Standish that found the cache of the tubers in the encampment that the pilgrims had occupied that the Native Americans had left several years before. And one way to use these tubers is just to slice them thinly crosswise and then fry them and make uh, uh, groundnut chips. So Jerusalem artichoke is considered native to New England, but it but that's because we use the arbitrary date of 1620. It was here then, but actually this plant is believed to be native to the Midwest, and the way it got to New England is that our New England tribes traded for it. As we had quahog shells and other things of value that we gave to the Midwestern tribes, and we got the juice and artichokes instead. And these are what the mature plants look like. And at, when the plants look like this, they're beginning to produce tubers. So these tubers are an off-season foraging opportunity. The, these are in the ground from September through the winter into the following April. There's the golf ball for scale. And you can use these most ways to use potatoes. So you can bake them, boil them, mash them, fry them, and so on. All right, so uh, I'll let you read through this later. But here's just a couple examples of different um, uh, initiatives where people are using natives and other edibles in landscaping. This is also getting increasingly popular now, and this is a trend I really like because this is just creating more food for everybody. And whether they're planting peaches or apples or they're planting juneberries or elderberries, I think it's terrific. So uh, Growing Natives is this very interesting program where they had kids going out and collecting seeds of native plants like black walnuts and acorns and stuff and passing it on to people to plant out uh, in different parks just to add biodiversity along the river systems. An excellent program that I think is worthy of emulation in uh, lots of other places. Um, this is a project in Seattle that you've probably heard about. 
It's uh, not focusing particularly on native species, but I hope they will work some into their landscaping here. We've got a similar project in Boston that's underway. You'll see that referred to at the bottom of the uh, slide. Uh, then here's a great park in Rhode Island. This one definitely has some natives worked into it because the aforementioned Kate Venturini from URI is involved with this project and she's got some native uh, plants in her uh, planting plant. So this is a wonderful project and here's more slides about how she does it. Uh, here's a project at Wellesley College just down the road from me where uh, they're working in natives as well as other species in a kind of a permaculture type landscaping, but another way where natives are being added to the environment, edible native species, which is great. Uh, now, I have information that I've put online. Uh, this is information that was a handout uh, in 2013 when I was a speaker at the ELA conference. Uh, and this handout is still online, so if you want more details about the plants I talked about in this show, plus many, many more, this is a good uh, spreadsheet to look at, so I encourage you to do that. And here's the book I've mentioned several times, and when Penny's follow-up information, she'll tell you how to get it, but it's published by the Essex County Greenbelt Association, which is a land trust covering northeastern Massachusetts, and the books cost 15 bucks, and they... I have donated 100% of the proceeds to them because they allow foraging on all their properties that are open to the public, uh, which is dozens of properties covering hundreds of acres, and I'm so grateful for that. Uh, I just told them, hey, use all that money and buy more land with it. Just create more foraging opportunities. So, and there's my contact information in case you want to follow up with me later. So that's the end of the show, and Penny, I'm happy to take any other questions. We have several more questions that have come in, Russ. The first is, is there an issue with different species of some of these plants? Are all of one genus okay? For example, Sambuca canadensis, nigra, etc.? Oh, that's a good example. Uh, actually, in that case, the black-berried elder is edible, but the red-berried elder is not, I believe, edible. Uh, I've heard a few accounts of it being edible, but I've heard many more accounts that say that it isn't edible. So I would not recommend eating the red-berried elder, but the black uh, common elderberry, the Sambucus canadensis, is edible. Yes, uh, sometimes knowing just the genus is not enough to know whether a plant is edible. You have to go down to the species level. Okay. The next question is about the spice bush. Can you make tea from the leaves? Yes, the whole plant has a spicy flavor, so the leaves have a wonderful flavor too, so uh, why not? Sure. And, and in general, you don't have to dry leaves first to make tea from them. You can use fresh leaves or dried leaves. Are all of the examples that you've discussed in this presentation in your book, Russ? Uh, most of them are, plus, as I mentioned, since when I'm interacting with the landscape on my own and with groups of people, I'm talking about weeds and invasive species, too, so my book covers uh, those as well. So, for example, you see that pie in the upper left-hand corner of my book? That is a strawberry knotweed pie made from Japanese knotweed, an invasive species that happens to be very delicious, and uh, you use it like a rhubarb substitute, so the recipe for that pie is in the book. But you can see on the cover here, I've got the beach plum in the upper right-hand corner. There's beach peas below that. Black locust, which is native in some parts of the country and considered invasive in other parts of the country. And the cattail muffins I talked about, the elderberry in the lower left corner. And then there's autumn olive, another invasive species, which happens to be highly edible. And then the black raspberry. So, so the book covers a lot of what we covered today in the show, plus a lot of edible weeds and invasive species. Okay. Uh, are Beach plums susceptible to black knot the way the other members of the Prunus family? That is a good question. I've never seen it on beach plums. Uh, theoretically, they would be susceptible to it, but I've just never seen it. Okay, next is about hickory nuts. Any tricks for cracking those? <laughs> yes, there is a trick. So let me go uh, see if I can get a good slide to show you. Uh, let's get back to the hickory nuts. Okay, all right. So. If you're looking in the lower left-hand corner, you see those big pieces? So I'm going to tell you how to get those big pieces out. So if you see the shape of the nuts, they have kind of a pointy end, and then the nuts aren't round. They have sort of a flatter side and a steeper side. And so what I do is put the nut on a hard surface, and the points are sticking out to the side, 
and I have it standing on its steeper side. So this is not how it lies naturally. You have to hold it up to get the nut to do this. And I hit straight down on it with a hammer. And I don't pulverize it. I hit just hard enough to send cracks through the shell. And more often than not, the two halves open right up. And that's how you get the big pieces out. Right. Uh, we have a couple of questions about APFs. Are these, yes, are this these one. beans edible? Uh, I've heard they are. And I don't know from personal experience because I don't encounter them very often. And when I have seen them, like this photo, which I took over in the left side, uh, I just forgot to try them, to eat them. But I have heard they are edible. And the other question about the same plant, do these become aggressive in the landscape? Ha <laughs> ha, good question. And the answer is yes, but it all matters what you're talking about with aggressive. You know. I, I saw these plants growing around rose bushes at a park right next to the Massachusetts State House, and I thought, how appropriate. They must know this very strong, important historical uh, significance of these plants that they helped get us started in Massachusetts. But actually, they eradicated them. They didn't like the vines growing on the roses, so it was very sad. Uh, I've also heard an organic cranberry gore almost spit blood about groundnuts because she said that it's the worst weed in her cranberry farm. And I'm very sympathetic to her, but you know, in actuality, that's just the kind of habitat the groundnuts like, that wet, sandy soil. So she's mainly created ideal groundnut growing habitat. And uh, you know, uh, speaking from an ecological context, it has a right to be there. Uh, so, but yes, this is a plant that um, is wild and it will do its thing. And if you don't like the, the vines die back at the end of the growing season, so they're not woody and persistent like a bittersweet, for example. So they're not going to weigh down your trees or anything. Uh, but it is a plant that once you get it established, it will probably be there. Okay, the next is not a question but a comment. Uh, the Resiliency Institute in Naperville, Illinois is also installing a community food forest with primarily natives. And you can get information about that at www.theresiliencyinstitute.net. Excellent. I will write that down. Uh, the next is a question. Instead of foraging for these plants, we can search out some of the native plant nurseries and plant some of these on our own properties. You and the wildlife can enjoy. So this is a, a recommendation for someone who doesn't want to eat them but does want to promote their use. Oh, sure. Uh, nobody tells you you have to go out and pick anything. And I'm sure that, um, in fact, I've heard this from some uh, ecological landscapers that, that uh, you know, will say, OK, I'm putting in ostrich ferns. You can eat these. but. Uh, the people whose house the ostrich ferns went in, they just like to look at the ferns and they never eat them. And there's certainly absolutely no harm in having the ostrich ferns in the landscape, even if, even if you're not eating them. OK. A few slides back, you talked about something being not edible. And the question is, did you mean poisonous? Oh, uh, let's see. What was I talking about when I said it was not edible? Um, well, uh, in the case of the viburnums, there are no poisonous species of viburnum. So maple leaf viburnum, for example, just doesn't taste good. So I wonder what plant it was that I was talking about it not being edible. Maybe we'll um, have a follow-up question for that. Sure. Uh, the next is uh, we will be sending information about where to find Russ's book. We've had a few questions about that. You'll be getting a follow-up survey after the presentation, and we will have information about how to find this book. One of the questions was, can you get your book on Amazon? Yes, you can. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm resupplying one of the uh, book dealers that carries it on Amazon with some books later this week. So uh, if it doesn't show up soon, it will in a couple weeks. So. Uh, uh, it is on there. OK, now let me mention the, the black elderberry, because this is something where I might have said something about edibility. These berries aren't good to eat raw, just in, in large quantity, because you might get a stomach ache from them. So you wouldn't get seriously poisoned, but you, you could have some uncomfortable uh, stomach cramps, whatever. So 
uh, but if you dry them first or cook them first, that completely removes that issue, and then they're perfectly safe to eat as many as you want. Okay. So that is the red Sambucus? No, this is the black elderberry. The red one, as far as I know, is poisonous and could make you more seriously ill than the black elderberry. Okay. I don't believe it tastes good either. Is there any part of the bayberry that's edible? Yes. Um, uh, I don't know about the berries. Uh, I've heard of some people using them as a spice, but I can attest to the leaves that if you use the fresh bayberry leaves off the plant, um, the aroma is very similar to bay leaves, although the plants are not related. Bay leaves are actually related to sassafras. But bayberry is in a different plant family, but it has a similar flavor. And you can use bayberry leaves instead of bay leaves in cooking. And if you're using the fresh bayberry leaves, they soften right up in the soup or whatever you're using them in, so you don't have to fish them out at the end uh, and worry about if they end up in somebody's soup bowl. The next question is, can you talk about companion planting for any of these edibles that you've been mentioning? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I'm afraid I don't know that very well. I know a good amount of thought has gone into that from permaculturalists who study very clear, uh, carefully uh, plants that seem to do well with each other. Uh, and so I would suggest uh, you know, uh, redirecting that question to a permaculture person who uh, probably is very well versed in that topic. I'm sorry, it's not an area I know very well. I can just tell you what I see together in a natural landscape. It's not really companion planting, but I can see, you know, when I see one member of a plant community, I usually see another member. For example, uh, the partridge berry that I mentioned before uh, that has edible red berries and the wintergreen berries, which has edible red berries, I often see those together in the same habitat. So as I'm walking through the woods and I encounter one, uh, almost always the other one shows up uh, very shortly thereafter on that same trail. Okay. The next question is about ferns. Can you eat the cinnamon ferns as well as the ostrich ferns? Uh, I have eaten cinnamon fern, and I've seen it in some old Boy Scout manuals. Uh, you know, it's a real pain to pick off all that wool. So, and the flavor is it's very sour. So I wouldn't really consider it as yummy as the ostrich fern. So you can eat it, but uh, I don't usually recommend it. Okay. Do you have a good source for native tree liners, such as hickory and persimmon? A tree liner? What is that? Uh, I think he's talking about saplings and... Oh, um, well, uh, I'm seeing those uh, as, as edible landscaping becomes more and more popular. I'm seeing more and more uh, nurseries carry those species. And uh, I can't recommend particular places to get them. Um, uh, I suspect Nasami Farm, the New England Wildflower Society in Waitley, Massachusetts, is going to carry both those species. I know they have shagbark hickory nuts because I've given them a whole bunch of nuts, which they have propagated and grown out into trees. So you can definitely get them from the New England Wildflower Society. Fedco, uh, a wonderful nursery up in Maine, also has shagbark hickory that I've supplied to them. Uh, and uh, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I think they have persimmon, too. Okay. Uh, what is the genus and species of the red elderberry? Oh, uh, well, the genus is Sambucus, and let's see. Um, why don't I know this off the top of my head? Um, I, I'm sorry, it's not coming to me, but the Racemosa is the species name. And anyway, the... The, it's very distinctively different, I think, from a uh, blackberry because the shape of the flower and the shape of the seed head is very different. The shape of the flower is pure medical. It's much more shaped like a sumac uh, flower cluster than an elderberry flower cluster, which is, uh, you know, a uh, uh, flat-topped uh, umbel, as they say. You know, it looks like an umbrella. So the, the confusing part about this photo here is it looks like maybe it's upside down, but it actually isn't. This is what the ripe elderberry fruit does when it's ripe, is the weight of the fruit makes the clusters hang upside down like this. Okay. We have just one last question, and that is, uh, are the stems of Solomon seal edible when they're young? Yes, they are. At that stage, the plant is really hard to tell apart from fall Solomon seal. So uh, 
true salmon seal and false salmon seal are both edible, I'm happy to say, at the shoot stage. So you don't need to tell them apart. It's not my favorite thing to eat, and it are, it, they are plants that uh, can be uncommon in the landscape. And so um, it's not a plant I uh, trumpet very heavily in terms of harvesting it, but I have seen places where there are thousands of these plants in the landscape, and then if you wanted to pick a dozen or so. And if you're just picking the shoots, uh, you're not killing the plant. It, it will uh, produce another shoot, most likely, the following year. Okay, and we've had one last question come in. In general, are named cultivars of a species still edible? Uh, yes, I think so. I can't speak with authority about that, but I believe so. And certainly in the case of elderberry, once again, since I've got that slide up, uh, there definitely have been cultivars developed for elderberry where the purpose of the cultivar was to make the fruit larger, the, 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 uh, uh, the uh, fruit clusters larger, so the choices as the plants are being selectively bred was for bigger and larger fruits. That isn't often true with cultivars where they're, you know, they're making the leaves variegated or something like that, where they're thinking of the ornamental value of the plant. But for some of these edible species, cultivars are being developed where they're focusing on enhancing the edibility. In those cases, certainly, you'd say the plants are edible. Okay. Thank you so much, Russ. This has been a, an amazing introduction to lots of native plants and maybe a reminder of some that we, we may have known about. Uh, and thank you all for attending. We hope you enjoyed today's webinar and we'll share your feedback when you get the survey. Uh, we will be following up with some additional information from Russ as well as information about how to get his book. So thank you all again. Thank you, Russ. Goodbye and good gardening to you all. <laughs>